Our next speaker, Brother Daniel Denham, was born in Pensacola, Florida. Uh, sometime way back there, and I won't mention when, it just might make him older than what he wants to be. He's a graduate of the Bellevue Preacher Training School when William Klein, the late William Klein, was the director. He's done mission work in Taiwan, served as an evangelist of local work in the states, Florida, Texas, Tennessee, and Virginia. And he currently works with the North River Congregation in Parrish, Florida. He's authored two tracts, numerous articles for Brotherhood Publication, and he's also, to, uh, also authored a number of chapters in various and sundry lectureship books. He's married to the former Barbara Stancliffe, and by the way, Brother and Sister Stancliffe are here with us. Sister Stancliffe on Saturdays to be speaking to the ladies. And uh, Barbara and Daniel have three children, Sean, Trevor, Megan, and two grandchildren. Megan, some, there she is. Megan's here with us. <laughs> I knew there was a reason they put this up here. I was wondering. You, where's Ken? He can get them on one side of the frying pan. I'll give them the hammer when they go up or down. <laughs> I know what you want, Brother Tarby. Do you really think I should let you come up here? Okay. Uh, how about let's wait at the end, if you don't mind, and then you can uh, announce what you want to do. Is that all right? Is that what you're going to do? Oh, okay, I see. It's, big, it's my fault then. Okay, well, thank you. I, it's got to be my fault. I had somebody, had, well, we won't get into that. Um, I saw you come up here, and I thought, now what is going on? Yeah, I noticed that. So anyway, uh, I don't know whether I did it or not, but it's all been turned over pages, and I just go by what's written. I won't say this, but many times Ken is up here doing this kind of thing, and since I want to bear all the blame, I'll now introduce Don Tarby. <laughs> I wasn't sure what was that all about, because I was going to let him, um, I say let him, we wanted to, to allow him to announce his new book, and I'd said something about that at that time, so that's what I thought they were up to. Now, I really don't care which one of you preached since you're here, but since you're scheduled, uh, Brother Don... Uh, you won't remember that about him till tomorrow anyway. But uh, do you mind if I read this to you now? Or are you in, do you want to take on whatever it was that I said about? Why don't you just go ahead and introduce me this afternoon when he, he speaks? <laughs> That's a good idea. I don't know why I didn't think about that. I, I think I better not, knowing the short memory of me and everybody else, um, probably need to just go ahead and do it now. Of course, you know all this time going on is eating your time. He's a native of La Mesa, Texas. <laughs> He's attended Freed Hardeman College in the 1950s, done local work in Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and Oklahoma. He now preaches for the Penn and A congregation in Atoka, Oklahoma. He also operates classic memorials in Denison, selling memorial stones as well as pre-need funerals for an area funeral home. I always think that's kind of interesting for a preacher to be involved in that. Um, managed the El Paso lectures for several years. In fact, I think I was on there some when you were managing that. Made some 16 mission trips to Africa and Scotland, toured the Bible and twice, helped establish the West Coast School of Preaching in Ghana, West Africa, uh, now a very thriving conservative school. He's authored a comment here on Revelation uh, with this ring. And more recently, the one he's going to announce is the ravening wolves and roaring lion, which he can do now, along with the his lecture. <laughs> uh, this is a book dealing with belief in God to counteract the work of... Uh, this is what's written in here. Stupid professors in the classroom. <laughs> Wrote some 35 religious tracts. Uh, some, they're now out of print, but debated John Edwards. I was at that one. Wasn't that the one where you debated Billingsley? Uh, both of them on the divorce question. Uh, he's been married to, he has his wife with him now, Jewel, since 2011. 
together. They have six children, 11 grandchildren, three great-grandchildren, and 47 great-great-grandchildren, and 62 great-great... No, it doesn't say that. <laughs> the last greats that weren't in here. He has three great-grandchildren. But once we've got all this through, Brother Don, now we'll let you come up and speak for 15 minutes. <laughs> I don't know what to say after all that. <laughs> Come take him away. Up until now, it's been a pleasure being here. <laughs> and I hope this will work out all right. We're brethren in the Lord. We can overlook things and some people. The study that's been assigned to me on Christ's confrontation on the subject of repentance has done me a lot of good because I had to delve into this topic more than I ever have in my life. And surely it will be helpful to you in some way. Christ is an example of opposing sin and challenging people to repent. You may recall in Matthew chapter 11 where he talked about Chorazin and Bethsaida and how that if the mighty works had been done in Tyre and Sidon, as, and also in Sodom, they would have repented. These people now had learned the word of the Lord and were not willing to repent and turn from sin. So Christ dealt with the subject of repentance, and so did the Apostle Paul and the other writers of Scripture. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 37, Paul said, The things I write, they were the commandments of the Lord. So whatever Christ taught directly and indirectly through the writers of Scripture, these were the words of the Lord in his confrontation against evil and encouragement of repentance. Repentance is probably the hardest command God ever gave for man to obey. And it's something that we need to consider. Now, even long before Christ's mission on earth and the New Testament age began, repentance was required of people. The Genesis record does not use the word repent relative to man's repentance, but even Joseph's brethren realized that they had done wrong and they demonstrated genuine repentance. When Jonah preached to the Ninevites, the Ninevites were to repent, and many of them did. Then we think of Jeremiah and his message urging the people to repent, and they would not. Now, repentance is something that God has always required of people. Now, in the gospel age, faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God is something new. And baptism in the name of Christ for the remission of sins is something new. But repentance has been incorporated into that. And no man can expect to please God if he's not willing to repent. There are at least ten areas of concern as far as the subject of repentance is concerned that we need to exploit this morning. First of all, the fact is that repentance is defined in the Word of God. Thayer, in his lexicon, defines repentance as a change of one's mind, changing for the better. We have two senses of repentance as far as the Scripture is concerned, revealed in the New Testament. Sorrow for sin and regret is worldly sorrow, and that is the kind of repentance that does not bring about life. In 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 10, Paul said, The sorrow of this world worketh death, not to be repented of. Then we have the example of Judas in Matthew chapter 27, who when he saw Jesus was condemned, repented himself, then went out and hanged himself. This was not the kind of repentance that we're talking about that we want to encourage people to do, but rather we have godly sorrow. Paul goes on to say in 2 Corinthians 7, 10, but godly sorrow works repentance not to be repented of. So that's the kind of sorrow we need. Not worldly sorrow, but godly sorrow. Good example of repentance in defining this would be from Matthew chapter 21, when Jesus talked about the man who had two sons, and he said to the first son, go work in my vineyard. He said, I will not. Afterward, he repented and went. 
went to the second son and said, go work. He said, I go, sir. But he went not. But the idea of his changing his mind and then going shows what repentance is all about. Look at the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15. He realized what he had made of himself, he made some serious mistakes. When he got so hungry and poor, he decided to go back home. And he said, I will return. Go back to my father and confess my sins. That repentance was demonstrated, of course, in his return. Secondly, we want to show the connection between as far as repentance is concerned in the Bible. Now, in Genesis 6 and verse 6, we find where it is said that God repented in the King James Version, or he changed his mind. Now, God often did change his mind. When sinners would repent, he would relent. Now, God did not sin so as to need to repent of sins. In 1 Samuel 15 and verse 29, it is said he was not man so as to repent. But repentance of sin is required of those who do sin, of sinful man. In Luke 13 and verse 3, Jesus said, I tell you nay, that except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Then in Acts 17 and verse 30, Paul said that God requires repentance of all men. He commands all men everywhere to repent. Now the first record of Christ's preaching and the very first word that's recorded in his preaching prior to the gospel age as recorded in Matthew 3 and verse 17 is repent. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So in his ministry he began with the word repentance showing that it was necessary then and also it's going to be necessary in the gospel age. The third thing we want to think about for a moment is that repentance is connected to baptism in the scripture. When Jesus gave the commission to the apostles, he intended for them to go into all the world and preach the gospel. In Luke 24 and verse 47, he said that repentance and remission of sins should be preached. Now Mark's account said that they were to go and preach the gospel. Those that believed and would be baptized would be saved. And we know that the Apostle Paul referred to the fact that he preached all the counsel of God, Acts 20 and verse 27. So when you look at what Luke says and what Matthew and Mark say, we know that the Great Commission involves faith in Jesus Christ, repentance of sin, and being buried with Christ in baptism so as to enjoy salvation. But even in John's ministry, prior to the day of Pentecost, we find that repentance was connected to baptism. In the third chapter, of the book of Matthew, beginning with verse 1, it is said, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then, as we come on down, we find in the gospel age that uh, they began to preach repentance as well. On the day of Pentecost, Peter said to those inquiring Jews, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Now, repentance was required as announced on that occasion. <clears throat> now, these Jews who had heard the word and were pricked in their heart already, <clears throat> excuse me, already believed. For in Acts 2 and verse 36, it is said, Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you've crucified, both Lord and Christ. Then it was that they were picked in their heart, realizing that they had been crucifying the Son of God, and they were to know assuredly that God had made Jesus both Lord and Christ. Now Hebrews 11 and verse 1 said that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Peter had presented the evidence that they had crucified the Christ and that he was the Son of God. He had been raised from the dead, and ascended into heaven and crowned king of kings. Knowing this now, they say, what shall we do? At this point, Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. So, Christ's baptism is connected to repentance and also to remission of sins. Now, without shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins, said the writer of Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 22. Without the shedding of blood, there is no 
forgiveness of sins. And so without repentance, there is no remission of sins as well. Christ emphasized this in Luke 13, 3. Again, in the fifth verse of the same chapter. Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. In the seventh chapter of the book of Luke, we have an in a situation where some did not repent. Some were not willing to be baptized by John's baptism when he preached repentance. They rejected that. This is interesting because of what is said in the chapter. We're told that uh, some did not receive the word of God. They did not repent. And therefore they rejected the counsel of God against themselves by not being baptized. So it is today when we reject the teaching of the Lord on the subject of repentance and baptism, we reject the counsel of God against ourselves. Next we note that repentance is connected to the kingdom of God. In John's baptism, he said, repent for the kingdom is at hand. And the same words are found in chapter 4 and verse 17. After Christ's baptism, he began preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now today... Repentance is a part of the new birth into the kingdom of God. In Matthew, John chapter 3, we find where Nicodemus was talking with the Lord, and Jesus said, Except ye be born again, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Nicodemus didn't understand that, so he said, How can I be born when I'm old? And Jesus said, in explanation of that, Except ye be born of water and the Spirit, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So they were to be born of water and the Spirit to enter into the kingdom of heaven. This would be an allusion to baptism in its part in the new birth. In John 3 and verse 23, we find where John preached and baptized in Enon near to Salem because there was much water there. Water, water was a part of it. Now on Pentecost Day, when the Jews indicated they were desirous of getting right with God, Peter told them to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And then we're told in verse 47 that those that were being saved were the ones who were added to the church. So in being baptized, they were saved, according to the Great Commission of Mark 16, 16, and now they're added to the church. Colossians 3 and verse 13, or 1 in verse 13, tells us that the church is the kingdom of God. For Paul said we have been translated into the kingdom of God's dear son. Those who were buried with Christ in baptism were added to the family of the Lord. Next we will note there's a connection between repentance and forgiveness. Now God requires all men to repent. And if they do not repent, he will not forgive. In the model prayer, Matthew chapter 6. A portion of that prayer had to do with forgiving us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. Then after the prayer was over, in the first explanation of that or any comment regarding the prayer, Christ emphasized, if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So if we want to be forgiven, we must be a forgiving people. Now, if God requires forgiveness between people upon earth, then he certainly also requires it of uh, people between him and their, their life here upon this earth. In the 17th chapter of the book of Luke, verses 3 and 4, Jesus talked about repentance. He said, If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. So Christ talked about the importance of being forgiving if someone is penitent. Even Christ himself did not forgive when people did not repent. In, Matthew, in Luke chapter 23, in verse 34, his prayer to the Father was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But when were they forgiven? On the day of Pentecost, they were still guilty of sin, and they were told to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. And when they did, they were saved and added to the family, to the church of the Lord. Now, we must always be ready and willing to forgive those who may sin against us.
But if they do not repent, that would indicate they do not want forgiveness, and we cannot forgive someone against their will. But we can at least not harbor ill will. It's wrong for us not to forgive if people are willing to repent. God does not require more of us than he does of himself. If God doesn't require a man to repent, then we should not. But if God does require, then we should expect the same thing today. If we confess our sins and repent, the Lord is willing to forgive us of all of our sins. 1 John 1 and verse 8, John said, If we confess our sins, he is willing to forgive us of our sins, all unrighteousness before him. Now, whether it's stealing or whether it's drunkenness, whether it's adultery, it doesn't make any difference. Sin is sin. We must turn away from these things if we're going to be pleasing in the sight of the Lord. Sin is sin and must be forsaken. In our area where I live, several years ago, there was a preacher and his wife moved into the area, and he sort of retired from preaching, attended one of the liberal congregations in that area, and uh, he and his wife, there was a woman in the congregation that laid eyes on him. She wanted him for her husband. And she worked and maneuvered and finally got him. Broke up that marriage and uh, married him. And they went away, began preaching in another congregation until things began to catch up with him. And finally he had to quit preaching. But I understand now that he's back in that original congregation where he and his first wife split up. And uh, they're identified with that congregation now in their fellowship. Then next we learn that repentance and faith are connected. Faith and repentance, there's the natural sequence of events. One has to have faith before he can repent. And that's the order that the Lord has given. Now I know we're going to talk about in a moment passages where repentance is mentioned before faith, but we'll talk about that later. But point out now that faith and repentance are not the same thing. Now, the Baptist denomination has a real problem here because Hiscox Church Manual says that they're saved solely through faith. That means not anything before, not anything after, but solely or only through faith. But later, on page 64, they, this writing is found, repentance and faith, inseparable graces. So you see, they've got them here now as Siamese twins, so to speak. They get faith in there and repentance there at the same time. But the question is, which comes first, repentance or faith? Now, if they're saved by faith only, then they're saved without repentance. If they're saved by repentance before faith, then they're not saved by faith only, because both would be involved. W.A. Criswell, in his commentary on Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, you can get from the internet, makes this statement. At the moment, a man exercises re repentance toward God and faith in Jesus Christ, he is born again. So what they're trying to do here is put them all together in one, therefore show the importance of repentance as well as faith. Now they have two passages to argue on this point. One is in Mark chapter 1 and verse 14, where reference is made to repentance and faith. John came preaching repentance and told them to believe. Now, repentance comes before faith as far as this passage is concerned. But uh, they do not emphasize faith to, to that degree to exclude repentance. And this, of course, gives them difficulty in their doctrine of salvation by faith only. Now, faith has come first. It has to come first in the... the scheme of things today. Godless sorrow works repentance. 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 10. And we know that one cannot have godless sorrow without believing in God. And yet that would come before the kind of salvation that uh, we're concerned about. One cannot repent unless he does believe. The other passage is in the 20th chapter of the book of Acts, verse 21, where the Jews and Greeks were recipients of the message that Paul was proclaiming. And they, he, they were told to repent and believe, simply meaning that they were to have the right attitude toward God and be willing to obey His Son, and they, they need to have the right attitude at all times. Repentance of sin, though, comes after faith in Jesus. 
Brother J.W. McGarvey, several years ago, wrote some comments on these passages. I'd like to share that with you. He said, it is true that Paul preached repentance toward God before faith in Jesus Christ, and that his aim was to induce men to repent toward God as a preparation for faith in Christ. John the Baptist prepared the people for Christ by preaching repentance toward God. Jesus did the same. And Paul, in ad addressing the heathen in Athens, first presented to them the true God, then called on them to repent of their idolatries which dishonored God, and then presented to them the risen Christ. The two themes were not presented in this order because it was impossible for men to believe in Christ before repenting before, toward God, but because if they are brought to repentance toward God, in whom they already believe, they are in a better frame of mind for hearing the gospel of Christ and believing in Him. In general terms, if we repent of sin against the light we have, we are better prepared to receive a, any new light which God may have fi seen fit to give us. Whereas if we are impenitent in regard to the former, we will almost certainly despise the latter. Brother Guy in Woods also makes comment on these passages and the difficulties that may be involved. He said, it is the acceptance of the facts presented that leads him to desire to repent. Faith then must precede repentance. Faith enables the sinner to repent. In fact, prompts the desire. Without faith, the sinner cannot repent. Without faith, he would not if he could. And irresistible and conclusive as these facts are, they are nevertheless in hopeless conflict with Baptist doctrine. Why? The basic assumption of their doctrine is the dogma of salvation by faith only. They insist that the sinner is saved at the very point of belief, before and without additional acts of obedience. With such a position, it becomes clear that they cannot place repentance after faith in their scheme. To do so, they would have the sinner saved before and without repentance. They teach that forgiveness of sins is at the point of faith and without further acts of obedience. And according to this view, repentance obviously cannot come after faith. For in that event, the sinner would be saved from his sin before he repented. In order to clear away this difficulty, and to include repentance among the conditions of pardon, they have simply switched the items, thereby holding that repentance precedes faith in natural sequence. Next, we want to point out that there is a relationship between repentance and restitution. Repentance is more than just being sorry or saying, I'm sorry for sin. But there needs to be a process of making things right in view of repentance. In Matthew 7, John told the people there that he preached to, or Matthew chapter 3 and verse 7 rather, that they were to show forth fruits, meat for repentance, speaking there to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now Luke's account of the preaching of John in Luke chapter 3 seems to be a little bit different. He was preaching to the multitude, preaching to all of them that were there. He was not telling them, first of all, to demonstrate they had already repented, but trying to get them to correct their lives from that time on, showing the results of having repented. Now some say that uh, John was act actually refusing to baptize these scribes and Pharisees until they did repent, but I think the context will show that he was emphasizing their repentance in the life that was yet to be. For in the third chapter of Luke, after he said, The axe is laid at the root of the trees, and every tree that, tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? He responded, First of all, He that hath two coats, let him impart to him that hath none. And he that hath meat, let him do likewise. Then the publicans came and said, What shall we do? He said, Exact no more than that which is appointed you. Then the soldiers came and he said to them, Likewise, do no violence to man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. So he's giving instruction here to these people who were told to bring forth fruit to come. And thus he explained to them what they would need to do. Now some say that... Uh, Repentance must be demonstrated prior to 
baptism, and I agree with that. But sometimes the, the context here would seem to indicate John was emphasizing something that would take place later. Now, in the Old Testament, offenders were required to make restitution for their wrongs. Read the book of Leviticus, the book of Exodus, where one would bar an animal or an animal might be killed. You'd have to correct that. You'd have to restore it and make restitution for it. When Samuel was rebuked for his sins, in 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12, he was told by the prophet that there would be four things happen to him and his family as a result of what he had done. He said, The sword will never depart from thy house, and there will be adversity in his household, and his neighbor would lie with his wife as he had lain with uh, Bathsheba in the darkness or in the secret. They would lie with his wife in the sunshine or in the light of day. And the child, fourthly, would be, would, life would be taken. Now in the New Testament record, we have the case of Zacche Zacchaeus, who in Luke chapter 19, he said, if I've done any wrong, taken anything wrong from someone, I will restore it fourfold. So he was going to make restitution as much as possible. Now we can't just say, well, I'm sorry, I'm going to keep what I have. I stole your horse, but I'm going to keep the horse. I stole your car, I'm going to keep the car. I stole your wife, I'm going to keep the wife. That is not genuine repentance. I have here a statement I found from the internet. One David Stewart, whoever he might be, wrote an article regarding the Church of Christ cult. And he says, repent in the Bible concerning salvation simply means a change of mind, not the forsaking of one's sins. The forsaking of one's sins is a result of growing in grace, which often takes many years as a believer grows in the Lord. One does not have to surrender anything to the Lord to be saved, but simply believe upon the Lord, Acts 16.31. The only thing that a person needs to repent of it, to be saved is their unbelief. Well, of course, that's exaggerating, trying to perhaps justify keeping some particular sin that may be in one's life. Next, we know, learn that there's a connection between repentance and correction. There's a close identification here with the word restitution, but this verse seems to imply more of a change of conduct than the matter of restitution making things right from the past. Paul said, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And the doctrine of Christ is suitable for correction, so we are to correct our lives. In Titus chapter 2 and verses 11 through 13, the Apostle Paul emphasized how that the grace of God that brings salvation has come, bringing deliverance to man, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. So we are to be living the kind of life that shows the fruit of repentance. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11, the Apostle, Paul, or Apostle Peter said that we are to abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Then in chapter 4, beginning with verse 1, he says this, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. These are the things of the past. When we repent, we repent of those things that are past as well. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1, Paul addressed a particular matter of the sin in the congregation there where a man had taken his father's wife and had her as his own companion. The Greek word for have here is the word echo, according to Thayer, means to hold in marriage in this context. And that's the same word that uh, is used in reference to John talking to King Herod in the sixth chapter of the book of Mark, verses 17 and 18. Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, 
for he had married her. For John said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Whatever was going on here was contrary to the will of God. Some time back, I had a preacher who is retired now visit with me and asked me a simple question regarding my position on marriage, divorce, remarriage. If I thought that I w it would be the right thing to do for one who's gotten into that kind of situation to have to put away that companion. And the way he worded it was, if I answered that I did, I was a scoundrel indeed. This man, as far as I'm concerned, is a very sound, capable gospel preacher. In nearly every area there is, except that one. But as far as I know, he's never preached that from the pulpit. But he holds the view that if you divorce, remarry, you do commit adultery, but only in the initial sex relationship, the sex act. Then from that on, that time on, it's not sinful. I have a quotation here from some of his writings. I went home and uh, began to look for some material and I came across something he had written. He said every time one, number one, divorces, and number two, remarries, the result is that adultery is committed. Then in parentheses he says, in the initial act. In other words, from that time on, you are not living in adultery. You're not living in sin. He denies that is possible. But he said it would be necessary, and in the case of John, he said that was a case of incest. So it was right for him not to be living with her because that was incest and not a marriage. Well, the text says he had married her, and John doesn't seem to be rebuking Herod for living with someone who was so kin to him that uh, it would not be proper. I went to the ISBE, International Bible Encyclopedia, to get a background on Herod and his situation, and here's what I learned. Herod Antipas was the son of Herod the Great and Maltese, a Samaritan woman, half Edomian, half Samaritan. He had therefore not a drop of Jewish blood in his veins, and Galilee of the Gentiles seemed a fit dominion for such a prince. He ruled as Tetrarch of Galilee and Perea, Luke 3.1, from 4 B.C. until 39 A.D. His first wife was a daughter of Arteus, king of Arabia, but he sent her back to her father at Petra for the sake of Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip, whom he had met and seduced at Rome, since the latter was the daughter of Aristobulus, his half-brother, and therefore his niece, and at the same time the wife of another half-brother, the union between her and Antipas was doubly sinful. Now, in this text, this brother would affirm that uh, Herod was not properly, lawfully, rightfully living with this woman and therefore needed to break up with her because it was the sin of incest, not because of any marriage. But you know, John doesn't refer to it that way. He refers to the fact that he had married her. And as a matter of fact, it was lawful, according to Roman law, for them to be married. She had been married to Philip before. That was a lawful marriage as far as the Roman law is concerned. But incest is that which is so, such a close relationship between the two that uh, they could not be lawfully married. But they were lawfully married then. But John, why would he be concerned about what this man was doing as far as Roman law or Jewish law was concerned? Some tell us that uh, John was actually trying to get him to understand that he had taken his brother's wife and this violated Leviticus 18 verse 16. But I don't believe that uh, John was that concerned about causing this Gentile to receive the law of Moses. It wasn't written for him and for that purpose. The passage in Leviticus 18.16 reads, You shall not uncover the nakedness of your brother's wife. It is your brother's nakedness. Now the word nakedness there is from the Greek Hebrew word erva, which refers to nakedness. It's not referring to fornication. That's not the way it's used in the Old Testament. 
Now true, nakedness and fornication usually go together, but one leads to the other, but they're not the same thing. Genesis 9.22 talks about the nakedness of the land or the nakedness of uh, Noah as the boys had viewed his nakedness. And Genesis 42.12 talks about the nakedness of the land. Now there are different kinds of uh, so-called marriages all need to end to please the Lord. First of all, incestuous marriages, we would agree that if one is living in incest with a relationship, calling it a marriage, that would need to be dissolved. What about polygamous marriage? They would need to be dissolved as well. But yet there are some today who are advocating that the, you can go ahead with that and have several wives. If you're in Africa or someplace like that, you already have them. Before you convert, you go ahead and keep them. Nowadays, we have same-sex marriage taking place. And you can put the word marriage to all of these. And if one involved in a same-sex marriage wants to become a Christian, he would have to stop living that way. Israel broke the contract, and they were to for put away their wives back in the Old Testament upon occasions. So it is that adultery is adultery. And Matthew 19, 9 points out that one who marries, one who's been put away, is committing adultery. It's contrary to the will of God. I know they argue regarding the tense of the verbs and so on and try to make it prove that you don't continue in, in that kind of adultery. But uh, look in chapter 7 of the book of Romans. In verse 3, he said, So then if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Now, I've been told by John Edwards and Dan Billingsley and so on, that uh, the word here doesn't have anything to do, this chapter doesn't have anything to do with divorce and remarriage or adultery, sinful adultery. And I don't know how they can come to that conclusion, talking here about the law of the husband and the law of the wife, but if while her husband lives, she be married. That's continually. She's still married to him. Certainly it's not right for her to marry someone, but just to marry him and then go to bed the first night and then be married properly from then on is beyond me. But she is married, that's a continual thing, to another man. And she should be called an adulteress. The word called here is a word that means the Lord is doing the calling. That's what he identifies it as such. This word is found some nine times in the New Testament. It refers to something that God identifies as such. So here God is saying here that she is to be called an adulteress because she married to another while her husband lives. So surely God hates divorce for those whom he has joined together and he hates marriage for those he has not come joined together or authorized. I thank you very much for your interest and your attention today. Yeah, well, Brother Denham, you did a great job. <laughs> Brother Tarbett always has done a good job. I heard him in the debate at, in Austin with John Edwards, and what he was finishing up there on was one of the things Edwards was trying to, to deal with, and I thought it was handled rather well. And this whole study is a much-needed study. Uh, I don't know that my words will help any at all, but it's my belief that when we really understand the New Testament doctrine of repentance, what it requires of an individual, great many things would be stopped in the way of sin in a person's life. So we need to know, and the church needs to be preaching and studying the biblical doctrine of repentance as it was set out at this particular time. Let me mention that uh, we do have an open forum coming up this afternoon at 3.30. Today, Brother Michael Hatcher is going to preside over that forum, and we want you, and at the lunchtime will be a good time to do that, write your questions, preferably dealing with what you've already heard here, if any questions have arisen in your mind. But we will accept any uh, Bible or religious question. We'll have it set up for that, and that's at 3.30. You can give your questions, uh, well, just go ahead and give them to Michael, 
be, like I say, they'll be written down. But uh, give them to Michael, or if you can't find them, give them to me, and I'll try to try to get them to him. So let's prepare for that for this afternoon at 3.30. We have, uh, following lunch, we have Brother Gene Hill going to speak to us. Christ confronted Aram about the end time. We want to be back in here at the proper time to hear him on that, which is 1.30. Now, regarding lunch, the ladies tell me that it's ready as soon as we get through here. And we want everybody to stay and enjoy the meal and visit together and continue to pray for us and our efforts in this lectureship as it goes out over the Internet and is going to be spread through CDs. And that brings up the sale of those CDs and the book that's available back here in the Contending for the Faith room. So feel free, please, to take advantage of buying more than one book if you can and uh, making it available to, to people. Uh, we think certainly it will be very beneficial in the areas which it deals. We want everybody to be sure that they have registered at the table in the foyer at least one time. And remember that lunch is uh, supplied today, tomorrow, Saturday, and Sunday. Uh, the lectureship book during the lectures is $14 plus tax. After the lectureship's over, it'll be $17 plus shipping and handling. The CD of the lectureship books from 1994, the first one through 2013, is available for $50. There are other book displays back there from several of our speakers, and uh, feel free to look through them and see what's there. We have audio, video available through, again, Contending for the Faith, and there are order forms in the Contending for the Faith book room. Again, let me remind everybody that each lecture is live on the Internet, our website, www.churchesofchrist.com. Let me remind you, don't park in front of the trash receptacle. Uh, we got them coming in extra time this week due to the extra things that get put into the trash. And I think it's tomorrow that they are coming. Uh, so be mindful of that and just make it a habit not to park in front of it. And again, uh, for security reasons, please don't leave any items of value in plain sight in your vehicle. What we're going to do, and uh, Brother John West is kind of heading this up, is he's got together some of the men this will be basically at night to do a little patrolling around the beginning or right after a lecture starts and then again sometime toward the end of it. And that should keep anybody hopefully that might be circulating around looking for a target of opportunity. So we're trying to say don't be a target of opportunity. <laughs> Those things I think we just have to keep in mind because of what goes on. We could have announced this the same way last year and years before but seemingly the way things are, are going, we need to make ourselves mindful of that. We haven't really had any more problems here than, well, I just don't think we've had any really. Uh, overall, over the 20 years, there's been a few little things. I think we had something stolen out of the out of room. In fact, the Contending for the Faith had money taken. But I think after 20 years, we're open, going, and coming to have as few as we've had is probably very good. But we might as well take these precautions. And uh, you just don't ever know just the time in which we live and where we live, that we just have to do that. Well, without further ado, I'm going to ask you to stand. Let's have a word of prayer, and we'll certainly thank our God for the food that we have.